This is a tale of 33 jaw chucks. Hang on, that's not right. This is a tale of three three jaw chucks. If you're a frequent viewer of the channel, you'll have noticed most of the time I either use a four jaw chuck or the collet chuck. It's pretty rare that I use this three jaw chuck because this thing is actually pretty terrible. It really doesn't hold very well. Uh, I think this thing probably dates from the Roosevelt administration, but I'm not sure which one. And if you only have one good chuck for a lathe, the four jaw chuck is the one to have. It takes a little bit longer to set up, but you can dial it in better. The only thing it won't do is hold hex stock. So most of the time I've been using that and just spending the time to dial stuff in a little better. But the convenience of the three jaw chuck is nice. So I picked these up. I'm gonna go ahead and get these broken down and cleaned up and then we'll talk about them some more. This thing's just packed with bronze, which I guess if it's gonna be packed with something, that's a good metal to be packed with. I know this isn't the ideal way to do it, but it's what I had to do, and I was careful with it, so you can save the comments. Mmm, crusty. There's a three there and a three there. I don't have a 5 16th key, but this flat screwdriver bit works for now. Start out by just throwing all of this in some simple green, letting it soak for a while. I gave these a rinse and a very light once over with some Scotch Brite, and holy wow, let's just take a minute to appreciate how well these all cleaned up. Okay, I think that's enough appreciating. I'm gonna start getting these put back together and talk about the history of lathe chucks in America while we do it. So this one is a, from Skinner Chuck Company. I found a price list for this on Vintage Machinery in 1955. This chuck cost $85, which is about $870 today. So good quality little chuck. It's also got some markings on here, which I believe are US Navy markings. Maybe someone that's a machinist mate can confirm or deny that for me. I'm using some of this pro grease. Ain't nobody got time for amateur grease around here. Spray grease. I feel like this is like the cheese in a can. It's not the right method for applying it, but we'll go for it and see what happens. Already got some grease in this scroll. You want just a light coat, which is why I'm hoping this spray grease works well. So James Skinner began making chucks in 1880 for the Union Chuck Company. This one's a Union. And then left in 1887 to start the Skinner Chuck Company. I'm not sure that really gives me a light coat. It's sort of a balance between too much grease that collects chips, not enough grease, does bad things. No marks on these. There were no marks on those pinions as to which way they go. This one's got a number stamped there and there that were lined up. A 
this is a really nicely made mounting plate for this. This one is three, two, So that should be a nice little chuck to put on my rotary table or if I need to mount it on the mill. I'm just running these all the way in, make sure they line up, meet in the middle, so I know I got them in right. And so while Skinner and Union were cranking out chucks in New Britain, Connecticut, not far away in Hartford, Cushman Chuck Company was making chucks as well. And Cushman found ways of optimizing the process and making them a lot cheaper and quicker, and eventually they won out and absorbed Union and Skinner. Out of the three, this one has the most wear on it. Jaws show a little bit of wear. There's a little bit more wear on these teeth. And the end of the scroll here might need to be filed down a little bit to fit in. It's kind of bent out a little. But I'm not going to show putting this together because it's the same as the last one. Cushman might have won out over the other Chuck manufacturers, but this one's a loser. You can see the jaws don't even really come together square. There's just too much wear on this to really be usable, so maybe I'll find something to do with it sometime, but for now. But if that one was a loser, this one is the winner of the lot. It's got the outside diameter jaws on it, which for some reason I don't see very often on used chucks. This one is branded Hardinge, and on the back it says Made in England. The internet leads me to believe this chuck was manufactured by Pratt Bernard, which if you're not familiar with is an English company that makes pretty good chucks. So that should be a nice chuck to put on my lathe, except it's a threaded mount, but it is too big to put on my lathe. This is a two and three sixteenths by 10 TPI thread. And the spindle on my lathe is one and a half by eight TPI. But I think that gives me enough room to make an adapter for it. This is the part where that Tony fellow would time travel into the future and get the part that he's making to make the part that he's making. I don't have the right change gear combination for that, so I'm just going to have to use the four jaw chuck. If I take this out of the chuck to check the fit, I'll lose the position for the thread. So instead I'll just take the whole chuck off. It's a little tight. Fifth time's the charm. And the next thing to do is to cut this register in here. This is an inch and a half by not very much. About a quarter inch, go a little deeper than that.
It's either going to fit or it's going to need a spring pass on it. Fits. So a little lack of forethought on my part is I made this way longer than it needs to be. So if I cut it off, I'm going to have, you know, that much scrap with a big hole through it. And I'd rather have a solid piece of scrap. But I also want to rebuild this collet chuck that I made a while back. I kind of blew it doing the register on this one, so the concentricity is not quite as good as I want. So I think I'm going to use that to remake the collet chuck. We'll set those aside for now. And I made another one off camera because it's a lot easier when you guys aren't looking over my shoulder. That's a lot better length for that. And now I have a more usable piece of scrap too. If I knock out these last few threads past the spindle nose, it'll give me just a little bit more room to pass stock through the chuck. Of course, if I want to find out how much runout this thing ends up having in it, I need a chuck key that fits it. I think I'm going to make it out of this drill bit. So the thing about drill bits is, this part is hard. This part is not typically as hard. So let's get rid of the hard part. I didn't do it, but that thing was pretty thrashed. Might still be able to grind something useful out of it someday. By side milling this, I'm avoiding a hard corner where it transitions into the shank. Cleaned that thing up with some emery, made a little handle for it. Figured I wasn't going to show that because it was going to be that interesting, then I got carried away and got a little artistic, but I can't show you everything. I also made it a little too small, so I just knurled a little bit in the middle there. So now that should press fit in there pretty well.
We've got that turned and faced. Let's flip it around and put an indicator on it. I'll call that six thousandths. That's by no means spectacular, but it's certainly plenty usable. I know indicating the chuck body is kind of meaningless, but I figured I'd show it anyway. Call that two and a half thousandths. Having a good three jaw chuck is going to be a very welcome addition to my shop. I hope you enjoyed seeing that, and if you want to see me finish up this collet chuck, stick around.